Hi, everybody. Welcome into another edition, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast, episode 112. Thank you for joining us, as always, on the audio side, Apple, Google, Spotify, whichever platform you may be listening on or watching us visually on the YouTube page, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast page. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. My name is Jim. James Anthony, as my mother calls me. Let me bring in professionally evaluator, successful business owner, former coach, the brightest hitting mind, I believe, across all of baseball in this great nation. I do truly mean that with all sincerity. Friend and co-host, Jake Epstein. Thanks, Wake Jake. up, boy. Man, we should... I feel like I could conquer the world right now after that. Pep you talk. sound great today, by the way. I'm using a different computer because I'm out of town. So this is a newer computer. It's my, my laptop. Mm-hmm. No ear- earphones or anything. Maybe it's the good acoustics of uh, who knows what. Are you I in like a say, house or what? what how how giant do my hands look drinking this coffee? <laughs> <laughs> they really do. I didn't notice that. I wouldn't That's, have noticed. It reminds me of that Seinfeld out. episode with the, the lady that eats the <laughs> lobster. Like the you know what? Uh, when, when I had lighting problems, I w- always thought of the Seinfeld episode of the of the girl that Jerry was dating when she was in the light or whatever it was. Yeah. That, was that was me. <laughs> so relatable. That show is so relatable. It's funny. Yeah, no, we, I, uh, I, did a, I watch uh, clips last, every week. Last minute for up in the mountains. My oldest daughter leaves for college in a, in, a, in a few days. So we came up one last time to Breckenridge as a family to kind of hang out for a couple days and um, then back to reality tonight. Would you like to tell everybody where she's going to college? A she's, big yeah, monumental she's, event. She's heading to the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is in obviously Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. And uh, so she's a business merchandising fashion major, one of those. So it's That's a pretty, tremendous. pretty cool place. It was there in New York City. I think I think we got the right choice. I always say, you know, how long we've known each other for. And you yeah. worked with me when she was a little girl. Which is, was she born? Yeah. She was born. She was yeah. she was born, but she, but she was just a little girl. Crazy. That's crazy. Crazy to think about. Monumentous events, yes. So cheers to that, and cheers to your enormous. It looks like I'm holding. Hands. It, it looks like I'm holding a, uh, like like a little tiny shot of uh, espresso, like an espresso mug. There was some some guy on on um, YouTube that commented on my hands always being you know in the way or whatever. Now he can comment. Oh, Let's see no. if he comments on your hands. Today. Yep, I'm gonna get blown up. Um, today's topic, episode 112, gaining the mental edge. And I got to thinking about this week preparing for the show. What angles do we take? And it brought me to Julio Rodriguez, who just signed that 14 year, $250 million extension with the Mariners. And over the life of the contract, he can earn up to $400 million. And I remember when he was struggling and people were talking about maybe sending him back down. And it got me thinking, why was he struggling? Was it something he was doing wrong mechanically? When you go one for 25, maybe. But I don't know. He probably didn't make a huge mechanical adjustment, right? It was more so gaining the mental edge. And what I mean by that, and I see this a lot with younger guys who come up to the major league level, whether it be a big time prospect or a middle guy, whatever the case is, it seems like younger guys anticipate the next pitch before the pitch that's actually coming. In other words, they're looking slider away rather than looking for that fastball they miss the fastball and that's why they look so late on it it's not a mechanical thing it's more of a mental thing and that's part of our topic today in gaining the mental edge yeah it is i, I we talked about this at some point i believe you know guys that that struggle at the big league level then they go back down and they do well then we bring them back up and, and they're comfortable with it did we talk about that on the show or was that just a conversation that may have been a conversation i had with a client actually but um yeah, usually it's comfort. It's usually not a big mechanical change. It's absolutely what you're talking about. It's, you know, being around people that have been there before and that are sharing knowledge with you. Um, you know, Garrett Mitchell just got brought up, I think, yesterday or mm-hmm. um, on, on Saturday for the Brewers, you know, and he was drafted two years ago and he was really hurt the first year. So he hasn't had a, a big track record yet, you know, in the in the minor leagues. He's done well, but, you know, he's only been maybe one full season. And so it'll be interesting to see, you know, how long he stays up and, and, you know, they're just going to get his feet wet. They started him out playing defense, right. You know, go in late in the game, play defense, and then you can have a start a day or two later. And that's just kind of the way it, it works for guys. You know, nobody usually comes up and just dominates and stays, 
You know, I mean, once in a while you may have somebody like uh, Soto that did it. I'm trying to think of other guys that um, Acuna, I think, kind of yeah. came up. Um, but did he? But did they break camp? You know, that's always a big thing. Did they get called up partway through the season, or did they come and make the squad right out of big league camp? You know, that's a lot less pressure than being called up in the middle of the season. So, nice. oh, the brain works wonders and in, in, in how we can utilize it or, or not utilize it for negative thoughts plays a big part in how successful we are as, as um, you know, hitters. Yeah. That's our topic today. Gaining the mental edge. We'll get more into that. I, I got to tell you, um, I was, uh, <laughs> I was, I, was uh, I promise I won't. It, I just think of the Seinfeld episode where she's the, same just, view. The, the whole time. He's just like, Ugh. um, <laughs> I, I was uh I, I you're gonna you're gonna get mad at me i was perusing um when i got home from the gym on monday night i was in my car and i was perusing twitter and uh i i saw hitting twitter I, was, I stumbled upon it and i got to thinking i never comment on this stuff but i got to thinking i i, I don't know i'm just spewing off here do people just wake up in the morning and just okay time to get on twitter and start a war Mm -hmm. I mean, some I have a couple of people in mind. I'm not going to name their names who do yeah. that. I just don't understand it. I mean, it's got to be tough being like a business owner and yourself being a professional evaluator and working for a major league organization, seeing all this and being like, what, what's going I on? I try here? not to. I, I try not I to get it. Yeah. I mean, it's there. I, I try not to see it. And I definitely don't get involved with it. I try not to, you know, take any sides. I think everything is useful if, if it is applied the right way, you know, yeah. even some of the, I mean, not all the all the drills, but I think there everything is you know, on social media is a drill. Yeah. Um, and and drills. I mean, if if you are born and you never pick up a bat, and at four years old you start doing drills, and that's all you know, then drills are kind of useful. But if you're like twelve or thirteen, and you're trying to do crazy drills at in slow motion. Mm -hmm. That doesn't carry over to even a hundred percent swing off a tee, you know. So you have to figure out, you know, how to train that person properly. And don't get me wrong, I I do some drills. I don't really do crazy drills, but I'll do bottom hand drills or no legs drills, you know, to isolate certain parts of the body. And we'll start slow. Hey, fifty percent. Okay, did you get it? Let's let's add, you know, five percent until we get to about eighty or eighty-five percent. Now let's go ahead and take a full swing and see what happens. Oh, it totally broke apart. Let's go back and, and swing. You know, and there's a process to that. But, geez, I watch all these artificial stretchings of the pelvis and the the wrists. And the well, the back. new one I found, a new one I saw um, on Monday, it dated back to last weekend. It was swing. I'm not going to name the guy's name. Swing down Saturday. Hmm. Swing down yeah. Saturday. Right. What, the, what, he, what are you talking about? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I uh, I disregard everything. Well, and then it's all the feel right. versus real, right? Like. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. there's just no it. middle ground. I don't get. I think I'm the middle ground. You know, we so, this so. podcast is the middle ground. And yeah. What makes us the middle ground is that we talk about the mental stuff. Mm -hmm. So all you know, so hitting Twitter and like whatever fill in the blank Twitter, they all get put on the pay no mind list. Now wagering gambling Twitter, that may be a different story, but nevertheless, just like the yeah, people who email us and tell us how to do the show better, or tell us that our analysis is wrong. I read them and then they get put on the pay no mind list, the spam mm -hmm. folder. <laughs> That's good. We have to learn from that, Jim. Spam folder. Oh, by the way, you could email Jimbo Podcast twenty one at uh, at gmail dot com. Nobody's going to email anymore. You just said you put them in the spam list. No, no, no. I put the ones who criticize us. I read them. I get a good chuckle, like a ha ha, and then I put them in the spam folder. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go back to watching Seinfeld clips. There you the, go. The big hands episode. Um. By the way, it's all. I know it's all. It's hitting Twitter. It's all ridiculous. Uh, by the way, though, you know what's ridiculous right now, in, in a good way. Like, you know, what the kids say or used to say, like, oh, that's ridiculous. Albert Pujols, I mean, the way he is hitting right now, I think the Cardinals may have something in that kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so Albert Pujols, and I'll read you a tweet from Buster Olney here in a moment, but I want to get your, your opinion on this. And I want to say this about the St. Louis Cardinals. They pose an existential threat to my team 
coming out of the National League, representing the National League in the World Series in 2022, the New York Mets. The St. Louis Cardinals have arguably the most balanced team in all of baseball between the veterans, their starting pitching, the bullpen is tremendous. The guys they have in their lineup, mix of veterans and young guys, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, Yadier Molina, Adam Wainwright, name a couple of veterans, Albert Pujols, of course. The St. Louis Cardinals, they've got something going on there, and they really do. I, I don't know. I'm a little worried about my pick. I may. I don't want to go back on my pick. I really can't, but I'm, I'm a little bit worried. They're balanced. They, yeah, they they're, they're, they're quality. I'm a little worried yeah. they may beat the Mets. To be honest with you, now, now, notwithstanding, I do want to talk about Pulhos because he had a tremendous and is having a tremendous month of August, and what we're seeing probably the final month, two months of his major league career. And you did a video on your Instagram at Epstein Hitting, and compared a video from 2005 to now in 2022. Let's just let's expand on that a little bit and and talk about that video. What do you see in Albert Pulhos that he is doing right now at the plate that's making him so successful? I don't know if he's doing anything different than he than he's done the last maybe seven or eight years. Um, he was so explosive when he came up, you know. He, he really was. I mean, he his hands were so fast and he was so quick, and 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 he didn't. He had a weight shift, but he he had you know more of a nose stride. He just kind of picked his heel up off the ground and then exploded his lower body. He was a little flatter, you know. His line drives carried a lot. A lot more because his bat speed was was better and then like anything else you know you get older you know and you're not as strong and you got to get it going so when he got traded to the angels he built in a stride all of a sudden he had a leg kick which you would only see in home run derbies so you would see home run when he was younger in, in the all-star games his home run derbies he would do a stride once in a while i remember seeing that but never showed up during the season until you know he signed that contract with the angels and he, he essentially got old you know i mean mm -hmm. it happens to everybody um, I guess it didn't happen to Bonds, but you know, it happens to most people, you know, they get old and they, they lose a step if you will. And so he had to find a way to do it. So he did it by, you know, building in a weight shift and, and having a bigger weight transfer in his stride, but he still rotated the same way. His hand path is like almost exactly the same. He tilts back a little bit more now than I would say he did when he was quicker and he could really stay on top of pitches with his hands and, and use his hands more, even on low pitches, he could drop, drop the barrel on it. So but he was more of a high ball hitter. His he may have been the best high ball hitter of all all time, at least in the generations, you know, prior to I don't know, 1960 or so. I mean, he just he never missed a high fastball. And he never missed it in an era where they weren't throwing high fastballs. You know, that was a more of a sinker slider generation. But if somebody made a mistake up, he just never, never missed it. Um, and so you're just seeing he's a guy that's hot. He's got adrenaline going. He feels good. I, I hope he continues to break it. Um, I, I think it's great that he's retiring and this is his farewell tour uh, along with Molina. I think that's really cool. Um, but I don't uh, I think he's based on, you know, his swing this year versus last year, or the year before. There's really no difference there. He's just he's feeling good, man. He's, he's with a team that is competing and he wants to be part of that. And it's his his home organization. And He's just keeping that adrenaline flowing here. Hopefully, he keeps it going through the rest of the year. Yeah, I mean, I wish he never left St. Louis, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I understand the business, but yeah. I, just, I wish he never. It would have been a storybook ending for him. I think Art Art Moreno and the Angels also wish he never left St. Louis. He had a couple of good years in, in, in Los well, Angeles. That was such a big, long contract, though. It was, yeah. Um, So, Albert Pujols, this is from Buster Olney on Twitter. Albert Pujols, since August 10th, 15 games, 10 starts, 20 for 44, hitting 455. Seven home runs, 10 extra base hits, 14 RBIs. All seven home runs and eight of 10 extra base hits have come against left-handed pitching. He's slashing against lefties, 560, 593, 1,440 in 27 plate appearances. All 10 of those extra base hits, this is what I like, to his pull side. 14 hits, seven swings and misses against lefties. I don't know, hitting to the pull side, it seems like maybe that bat speed and bat quickness. Yeah. It's still not what it once was, but it's it's still no. there. Well, you can see those home runs he hits, they clear by like 10 feet now. Right. You know, they're not yeah. they're not bombs, but he's squaring it up. You know, left handers one of the things that helps is flexibility in your shoulders and your neck. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you're facing a left hander, they're delivering, and you're a right handed batter, they're delivering the ball from the second baseman side. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to rotate your neck as far. You can keep your shoulders closed and still see the ball coming out of the release point. Um, plus, things are moving in more. It's coming from an angle from that side of the field back towards the plate, even if it maybe has a little bit of cut to it it's still moving in that general direction, which makes it much easier to square up. Okay, so think about like when we, when I use machines or we use machines at the lab, we always set them up as a right-hander or a left-hander. And it gives you a good idea when you're doing that is, wow, this release point is usually, you know, three feet to the side of the rubber. You know, the ball doesn't come straight down the rubber and it gives you an idea of when that ball, you know, it's working away from, if it's a, if it's a right-handed pitcher or a right-handed machine set up as a right-handed pitcher, I guess the right-handed batter, it's it's moving across the plate a little bit more just because of the arm angle. So that does play a big difference with with guys that are hitting opposite. You know, they're like Pujols is hitting against a left-handed pitcher. He can stay closed a little bit longer to see it. But then if he pulls off a little bit, you know, quote, um, then he's going to be better, better served with a left-handed pitcher making a mistake down the middle of the plate than a right-handed one that's, um, you know, going to be kind of, working away from him i was um you mentioned the lab in there i was watching some shark tank clips this week and there was mm -hmm. that one episode of when the guy went in and he didn't want to work with kevin kevin o'leary told him to get the f out and uh, then the guy had the balls to ask everybody and say um so is everybody out and and everybody would literally looked at him like he was crazy now my how does that relate to the lab jake's a great business owner and he's got great things going on at the lab bcs coming up am i right I do. Yeah, I'm going to be there uh, the 10th for mm -hmm. a awesome like player assessment. So mm -hmm. we're going to take, I don't care if you're in Houston or Waco or Dallas, like find a way to get there because it's super cheap compared to what you're what you're getting. And, you know, if you went to a perfect game showcase, we're only taking 20 players and we're going to test them on everything. So we're going to test them with the K vest. We're going to bust that out, see how their body's moving. We're going to test them. Uh, with hit tracks, we're going to test them with blast to make sure that their swing is in the right spot, give them notes on that. We're going to have them run 60s. We're going to have them do vertical jumps. We're going to test their grip strength, and we're going to find out what they're good at and maybe areas for improvement. And then we're going to provide everybody with kind of a synopsis of, of what they gained and, and tell them what they need to work on. From there, we're going to do it like every quarter. So like every three months, we're going to do it and make sure we're charting the right way. And it's super, 200 bucks. You'll probably be out there for three or four hours. You know, usually those are $800 assessments. So yeah. we're taking the first 20, probably our members. But if you're listening to this and you're outside the area, jump in one of those spots because we haven't quite publicized it yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wearing the Lab BCS hat. Somebody asked me if, if the hat is um, a paraphernalia for, for the podcast. I said, no, it's for the lab bcs so the lab bcs.com for more information yeah we can make a podcast hat we'll have a propeller on Maybe. it <laughs> with those big hands of yours <laughs> um the lab bcs.com yeah the cardinals i, I gotta tell you i'm really Gosh, excited i'm really excited for them they uh, last week we talked about lineup identity they have arguably the best lineup identity in all of baseball and yeah. I, when I look at their lineup, they have, first of all, the best three, four guys in all of baseball in Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado. But what I mean by lineup identity, we touched on last week, what I mean personally, putting guys in position in the lineup to best maximize their chances of success. And with Goldschmidt Arenado hitting three, four, it doesn't matter at that point, if you bat in the top of the lineup, the middle of the order, bottom of the lineup, if you, it makes it easier for the pieces to fall in place and put guys where they need to be, whether you're young, you're old, veteran, rookie, doesn't matter. Batting number one, batting number nine, you're put in that spot to maximize the chances of your success. And I think the Cardinals have that tremendous lineup identity that serves them well and gives them a lot of depth offensively. It'd be neat to see the behind the scenes on that because remember they got rid of Schilt last year who was like, look, I want to, I want to run the team how I want to run the team. And he was very successful doing it. You know, he wasn't listening to every single outside influence coming from the press box during the game. You know, he was running it as an old school manager and they removed him from that, which was a shock to everybody. And they, they 
found a way to be as good or better. And I'd like to see the, you know, how they did the dynamics. I'm sure they keep that pretty close to their, close to their vest, but um, you, you actually called it. It was a couple podcasts ago when the Cardinals and the Brewers were, I think tied or the Brewers may have still been a game up on them. And I said, that's the biggest threat. They need to win this, win the central, the Brewers. And you were like, yeah, they're not going to win the central. Like the Cardinals are, too good and then the cardinals boom just stretched out to seven or eight games in yeah. what two or three weeks so you you kind of saw that coming yeah i, I don't know there. i just um i just love their lineup yeah. i mean last i was watching the game last night against the braves and i think the braves went up like three nothing four nothing and i'm thinking oh well that pitching you know I, yeah. they're not gonna and i tune in bottom of the ninth because i watched the giants collapse too last night oh god almighty and i turn i tune in bottom of the ninth to finish up the Cardinals game and they walk it off with a walk-off walk. I mean, you know, if that doesn't tell you something, I don't know. I can't help you. Right. So yeah, uh, the Cardinals will be interesting going forward. I'm really looking forward to seeing um, yeah, seeing how things unfold here in uh, the month of September going into October. I think the postseason is going to be very exciting, especially big, more bigger market teams. No offense to the smaller market teams, but bigger yeah. market teams make the postseason. And then, like the Mariners say, they break that drought. It's going to be um, very, very exciting. Be sure to email us, jimbopodcast21 at gmail.com for all of your questions, concerns, comments, and try to avoid going into the spam folder. Now, mind you, you don't go into the spam folder if you have a good question or a good comment. But if you don't, you have spam written all over you. All right, let's get into today's topic, episode 112, Gaining the Mental Edge. And we touched on earlier in um, in the show about younger guys and how they can gain the mental edge. But let's just talk about, and your dad mentioned this in his one of his books, about you know using those old school reports. And there's so much information out there now. How do you go about using those old school reports and gaining the mental edge for not just the starting pitcher, but the entire pitching staff overall, because you know that on the other side, those pitching coaches, they've got the edge on you or trying to gain the edge on you with all of their reports as well. The mental edge has to be different for each player. So mm -hmm. if you're somebody that wants and uses information, then you can filter through it. Some people, they don't want anything. They just want to react to the pitch. Yeah. And so then you have to deal with those people, you know, a little bit cautiously uh, mm -hmm. with white gloves, if you will, and give them very small talking as a hitting coach, you know, mm -hmm. small information like let's be on time with a fastball. What do you, you know, what do you want to hit here? I want to look fastball and react to something else. Okay. So let's make sure we're on time for that fastball. Let's make sure your rhythm is right. Let's make sure I just read a, a tweet. <laughs> it's, I had to bring it up um, with, oh, why can't I remember his name? He's all probably, over. It's probably better you don't. She gone. The she gone guy. No, it was a great tweet. Oh, uh, the second no, Jeff Fry. Jeff Fry. So, followed him a while ago. Yeah, he was saying that he was he was you know talking about facing Greg Maddox, and he noticed something with his grip every time he would throw a cutter. Yeah, um, I think it was a cutter he was talking about. He noticed something in the grip when he was warming up, like before the you know his his a pitch is to start the game. He just noticed something. And he took that into his first at bat and said, okay, I'm going to sit on that cutter. And I know that if I see that grip, whatever, whenever he's doing it, I'm going to get it. And he said, I, I was able to, you know, get a line drive base hit my first at bat just on that. I mean, that's a game time adjustment right there. He just noticed something. Maybe Maddox never did it, but that day he was, he was off and he was tipping something. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's mental edge right there, you know, and typically guys that are a little bit grittier, you know, guys that have less athleticism, guys that are smaller, um, guys that have vision problems, they have to be smarter. They have to have a better mental plan. They, they can't just go up there and, and react. I told this story before with Larry Walker, you know, back in the day, uh, my dad talking to him and my dad saying, you know, what do you, you know, look for a different event? He's like, oh, I just, I just react to, I don't look for anything. I just react. I remember my dad saying, man, you must really have good vision and, you know, athleticism to do that. And Larry said, yeah, I've just always kind of been like that. And and my dad, who has like 2,800 vision, was like, geez, I have to look in a certain area and and whatever. But he got to talking more to Walker. And so Walker said, well, if the guy's not getting his breaking ball over and the counts want to know, what do you look for? And Walker said, well, I look for a fastball. <laughs> so even when people say they 
they don't cheat or they don't react. They always have a plan. Um, and so you, you have to kind of figure what's what's best for you. The old plans were feel. You know, they weren't even written down. It was just, you know, the players would kind of, whenever I face this team, whenever I face this team, they always attack me this way. My dad can still, he's 79 years old, and he could still tell me how different teams and pitchers used to attack him. Like that's just, he just knew it. He didn't have to read a report. They weren't giving any reports, but he had that, that brain that said, okay, these guys try to work me here. This is what I'm going to do. And that's when he became a good hitter is when he would talk to Williams about that. Cause Williams asked him, well, what do these guys do to you? And my dad's like, Oh, I'm, I don't know. Let me go back in my memory bank. And then he started to create a plan and Williams would say, okay, well, this is how they do it. This is what I want you to do. And then my dad was able to, to kind of formulate a plan and then, and then carry it out. And then when he, my dad would beat, say, beat that pitcher one or two times, then Williams would take him inside and say, okay, now they're going to do something different. So, um, yeah, you have to be mentally sharp. You have to have something. And mentally sharp may not be anticipation. It may just be mental clarity, you know, relaxing before a game, sitting in a dark room, you know, visualizing your bat. That, that could be your mental plan. Um, it could be timing and rhythm. Okay, I'm going to prepare myself mentally and physically for this game to make sure I'm going on time. Um, maybe I'm going to, um, I don't know, take, I, I'm going to work out today. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a different workout before the game. Maybe that makes me feel better, you know, mentally and physically. I feel better. I feel prepared. So it doesn't have to be a mechanical thing. It doesn't have to be even a hitting thing. It can be how do you prepare yourself for your best self to show up in the batter's box that night. And it could, maybe it's diet. You know, I have the, I ate, I ate good today. I ate clean today. Um, I had a good workout and man, I feel great going into this game. That could be a positive mental plan too. You mentioned something in there in tipping pitches. You taught me a decade ago what to look for when a pitcher is tipping pitches, but let's expand it on a little bit without giving too much information, of course. Um, you have to go to the lab BCS or Epstein online hitting Academy to learn that, but tipping, tipping pitches. Um, how does one, a hitter start to look for, I mean, you mentioned Jeff Fry in there with Greg Maddox. I mean, guys were always, you know, back then with some of the toughest pitchers, Maddox, Glavin facing those guys, Yeah, especially if you're in the national league East on a daily basis, you had to try to find that, that edge, not just mentally, but, but physically as well. So how do you go about, this is part of gaining that mental edge, finding the 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 cue, if you will, and in, in sure. when when pitchers are tip when pitchers are tipping. Experience talking mm -hmm. with with other people. Uh, gosh, I remember I played with uh, Kirk Sarlos, who you know was an All American pitcher at at Fullerton. You know, in a big leaguer, he coaches. He's a head coach at TCU now. God, he was so good. He wasn't even a hitter, but he would go through and by like the second or third inning, he would find something on the pitcher that day and, and be able to share it with the dumb hitters, you know, that he, he figured if he helped us out, then we would score more runs for him, you know, the next day. So, um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's how they um, hold their hand. You know, sometimes it's the angle of their hand or their elbow when they're, they're getting a sign from the catcher. Um, yeah. They know what they, you know, they're throwing ahead of time and maybe they, they pre grip it. Sometimes it's the angle of their glove. Sometimes they'll flare their glove if they, reach in to get a breaking ball sometimes you'll see the glove flare sometimes they'll flare the glove at different times or all the time remember Dempster used to do this all the time because he was tipping pitches back in the day so he would flop stuff around you know so that you couldn't figure it out but you know amateur pitchers are notorious for it for me I can usually tell with amateur hitter or amateur pitchers meaning high school and below not necessarily as much college even though they're amateurs but um, they'll speed up their delivery. So I'll notice a jump or they'll speed up their arm action, taking the ball out of their mitt. And even though I'm not seeing anything crucial, it, it's different. Well, that was different. That was faster. He was rushing his breaking ball, getting his arm into the slot, or he was rushing his change up. Um, so sometimes it's speed. All of a sudden, they, their leg kicks a little faster, you know, something like that. And you can be like, okay, that was faster. You know, I'm, if you're sitting on a certain pitch, I'm sitting on a fastball, and all of a sudden I see – the pitcher jump at me or, or, or lift his leg kick faster or higher. I'll be like, okay, that's a breaking ball. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not prepared to hit for that. Um, and you can pull the, pull the abort, you know, button, press the abort button. So little things like that could happen. I played with a guy 
in Missouri. He was so nasty. He was hard to catch. I'll never forget. He was my roommate, Ryan Jamison. He was so filthy. Like, I don't really, I had a hard time catching him. If I didn't have a good night's sleep and a good breakfast, and we had an early game inter squad, he beat me up. I mean, everything moved. He had a, he had like a cutter, a slider, and a curveball. And then his fastball ran six inches the other way. And he used to get lit up in conference. I don't know what year, not all the time, but one year he just got lit up and we're like, we can't touch this guy in inner squad games. Like, mm-hmm. we're not that bad of hitters. How is everybody jumping on? Anyway, every time he threw a breaking ball, he would just pop his finger out of his mitt. And we're like, yeah. how is no one chasing his breaking balls? They're so nasty and they all came. And that's what it was. And as soon as he fixed that, boom, had a great year and the Astros drafted him. So, um, you know, tipping pitches, it's, it's now it's so like crazy because there's video cameras and all that kind of stuff. And and pitchers are actually taught, you know, to make sure that they're not tipping any pitches. But, um, you know, once you get below high school, high school and below, you can still, you know, find a way to pick that kind of stuff up. And obviously at the big league level, too, it still happens. So people talk all the time about the 2019 Nationals team and they debate whether starting pitching or the offense, Anthony Rendon, Steven Strasburg, they were at the center of that when they became free agents. Which unit, if you will, was more important and more vital to them winning the World Series? And I point out a guy, his name is Jim Cuthbert. He was the Nationals advanced scout who pointed out in game six in Houston that Steven Strasburg was tipping his pitches in the first inning. And then after that, Strasburg led the Nationals on the mound to that victory. And then, of course, in game seven. So there you go right there to your right. point about about tipping the pitches and the, with the video and everything else that great advanced scouts now have these tools in place where they're helping you get as a hitter, not just the physical edge, but the mental edge when pitchers are tipping everybody's looking for it now, you know, everybody's trying to, trying to find an edge, right. And there's the game, you know, is, is so fast and complex now that those little edges, you know, make a big difference sometimes in a world series outcome, like you just said. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned routine and you, you talked about this with me about a decade ago, getting into a routine. It's something a player has to do. A coach can only help you so much get into that certain routine that, expedites the the gaining the mental edge and and trying to figure all of that out so um what do you suggest for a player in trying to put together a proper routine that would help them gain the mental edge not just on game days but also on off days as well because it all sort of blends together yeah i mean having a routine whether it's uh mickey tettleton for those old school guys that know he used to eat Fruit Loops before every game, mm-hmm. to Wade Boggs, he used to eat chicken yeah. before every game. And the socks, right? The weight when he went well, he was doing yeah. something with the socks, not changing yep. that. So, you know, having a routine, and that's just a mental edge that he felt good. That didn't, you know, determine any outcomes, but he felt good. He felt prepared. He felt ready to go. So, um, you know, as far as having a routine, I do work on that with, with players. You know, how do we get from the on deck circle to home plate? You know, what is your process for that? Are you running to home plate? Please don't do that. You know, are you walking? Are you relaxing? Are you taking deep breaths? You know, you look down, you get a sign. You, you you know, look at your bat, you focus, you look at the foul pole, whatever your focus is, your center, you take a big deep breath and then you get into the box. The routines I don't like are the whole batting load, you know, in and out and this and that. You know, I don't teach that, but, you know, whatever it is. No more routine. Yeah, the no more routine. Whatever it is for you do it and and trust it and and stick to it and and make it part of your dna so that you don't have to think about it i mean i haven't played i haven't faced a you know a live at bat whatever since 2001 i probably would walk up the same way and put my right foot in the box the same way and hit the hit the plate the same way take a deep breath and be ready to go like it's just in there so um, sometimes I do have to have younger players practice that. You know, what do you normally do? Oh, I don't know. I just step in there and spit, you know, or whatever it is. I'm like, okay, well, let's let's take a breath. Let's, you know, I talked to him about finding a center, you know, look at a certain part of your bat, you know, look up at the foul pole, look, you know, whatever it is, something that's always there no matter what field you're playing at, okay? And they'll say, well, home plate's always there, but I, I you don't want to focus on home plate. You don't want to have your head down, you know, so take a deep breath, have good posture, stare at your bat. Okay, good. And now I'm ready to rock and roll. And then you're prepared. Okay. But if you ever feel off, like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, you're you're in the hole, right? You're in the hole. And all of a sudden, 
the uh, first guy swings at the first pitch, you know, boom. And then you're like, holy crap, you know, he's base hit. Now I'm on deck. I don't have my batting gloves on. I don't have my helmet ready yet. And then all of a sudden the next guy bunts the first pitch, bunts him over. And all of a sudden you're up to bat and you're still looking for your helmet, you know. And anytime that happens where you're caught off guard, it, it will mess you up. So always be prepared. You know, I mean, you could do that for life in your homework. Always be prepared. You know, know the night before you got a test. All right. Before you go to bed, make sure all your books are set up and in your backpack, your backpack's ready to go because you don't want to be flustered before you take that exam. And it's no different in the work world. Nope. Oh. That's for sure. Oh, by the way, kids listening out there, do me a favor. Do us both a favor. Don't run to the plate. And when you strike out, don't run don't back run to the back. dugout. I, I hate that. If, if, if my kid ever does that, I'm just going to say, you know what? You're not playing baseball anymore. No, we're going to find another sport. That's it. You're not going to run back to the dugout like some jerk off. Like, oh, he struck me out. I'm going to run back to the dugout. No, no not happening. All right. Good stuff this week. Episode 112, gaining the, the mental edge. I'm the master of segues. Let's get into our listener question here. This is a good one. Um, Nick sent us back another listener question. Um, we do appreciate that. We will get to that one next week. We're going to push it back because this one has to do with Spencer Torkelson. And um, we want to get to that because um, um, he may be called up again when the rosters expand in September. So let's get to the mm -hmm. Torkelson yeah. question. And this comes to us from Mike, who has written in before. Good question here. He writes, Jim and Jake watching the Giants against the Tigers on MLB Network. I was wondering what happened to Spencer Torkelson, who I knew was sent down to AAA, where he's hitting 226. I remember Jake's breakdown of him, which was quite good, so I watched it again. Could Torkelson's swing plane issues be corrected by changing his arm slash hand position in his stance and load and correcting his head position and posture during his approach? Thank you. And that is from Mike. Before I let you answer that, Ep, I did some research on Torkelson and I listened back to um, some of the things you said about him and you predicted that he would be more of a right center field type hitter. I'm looking at his swing currently, his load into his rear hip. It's okay. He's got a pretty good launch position, but again, uh, he's slashing, uh, and this is uh, as of yesterday. So Mike was correct when he emailed us, but he's now slashing in 118 at bats at AAA, 229, 341, and 381. I've always thought with him, though, if there was an issue, it was his bat path. But I'll let you answer the question. Listen, the, the guy's good. You know, the, guy, right. the guy's talented, um, and, and I'm wrong. I'm wrong sometimes, you know, I'm not, I'm not right all the time. I'll tell you who I was wrong with, mm -hmm. uh, Shohei Otani. Uh, I didn't think he would be successful with his swing. He's got a kind of a funky swing where he fights against his body in his swing point. And I was like, I don't think that's going to be a consistent move. And you know what? I was wrong because he's an absolute freak. Um, and he had his bat to ball skills. So it's not always about mechanics. It's not always about path. I was reviewing some of my notes from previous drafts, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I can learn from them and, and what am I seeing? And one of the Nolan Gorman things, you know, for him, I was like, his swing path was a lot like Torkelson's. Um, it's not like that anymore. So at the time of the draft, he had kind of a, he was swinging up at 15 to 20 degrees and had kind of a barrel drop because he was a high school player hitting against high school pitching and VP and trying to launch balls 400 feet. And as soon as he got to the minor leagues, he flattened that thing out. And, and it made all the difference in the, <clears throat> in the world. And that's where, you know, player development is so important to, you know, yes, we have guys that, that draft players, but then what do we do with those players? Do we leave them alone or do we have the right plan for them? So Torkelson, when I saw his draft, yeah, he hit 30 something home runs in college or something. I mean, the guy's explosive sure. when he, when he finds the barrel a lot like, um, what is it? Uh, the, the kid, the, from Texas last year, Yvonne, Melen, what's his name? The Hispanic that. Titanic. He hit thirty something home runs in college. He broke. He was awesome. For the, oh yeah, I'm sorry. His name. I know. Anyway, I, I'm picking in my head. Or, anyway, I mean that dude rakes, and 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 he actually has. I, I liked his swing, but I mean, you look at those numbers, and he he didn't go in the first round. You know, and it's like, wow, there's so much more to this than than numbers. So Torkelson, yeah, I mean, his barrel was down a little bit more than my taste. I haven't seen him in two years, so I'll be honest, I haven't. I haven't looked at his swing because he's not a brewer. Um, so he did that. He dropped his barrel and he had good timing. And if you don't have a great barrel path, but you have excellent timing, Shohei Otani, and you have explosive hand speed, 
mm-hmm. Shohei Otani and maybe Spencer Torkelson, then you're going to be able to get away with, you know, things. So if Torkelson kind of does what Nolan Gorman did and flatten out his swing plane, the mechanics are there, his launch position's there. Yes, if his hands were a little bit higher and he, you know, slotted the knob a little bit lower on on his, his first move and instead of, you know, kind of pulling it up too much, then he will absolutely, his swing can totally change. You know, it's nothing crazy that he needs to change except flatten out a little bit and stay in the zone longer. Um, maybe his rhythm is a little fast. I do not know. Um, but if he's jumpy and he's dropping his barrel, then, you know, that that could be an issue. But I, I, I think he's probably going to be fine. Um, and he'll definitely be fine if he makes those small adjustments. So, I mean, I noticed... Looking at Goldschmidt last year, Goldschmidt was brutal at the end of last year. Like, I saw his swing was so bad. Like, he was dropping his barrel so much that it was frustrating for him, I'm sure. And then this year, I'm like, what the heck is this guy doing? He is in so much more control of his barrel. You know, he's he's so short and quick this year that he's he, he almost seems like he was trying to sacrifice power. Like, hey, I'm just going to put the ball in play and find barrels and and be short and quick instead of, you know, really trying to drive balls. And it's made all the difference. He still has a ton of power because he's so strong and quick. Um, but his barrel does not drop. His vertical bat angle last year, I have so many videos of him dropping underneath fastballs at, like, the the top of the thighs. Mm-hmm. And then this year he's getting to all those pitches. So, uh, again, you know, players that can make that adjustment, uh, if, if, if Torkelson was in the Cardinals organization and he was able to talk to Goldie about, you know, different things, I think that would be very beneficial. I don't know who he has to talk to, you know, in the minor leagues, but it's not a mechanical thing. I think, yes, his hand path, you know, the question is absolutely right. His hand path does need to change a little bit and, and he'll be fine. Well, thank you, Mike, for the question. Any further questions from anybody, email us jimbopodcast21 at gmail.com. I, I would imagine with Torkelson, though, and the Tigers, he is, has to be have to get him right. Another guy I want to ask you about, by the way. I'm going off here. Sorry, but um, saw swing last night, home run swing. Uh, Jace Jung, mm-hmm. the younger Jung brother, Jace Jung. Did you do a report on him at all? Uh, Left-handed which... batter, outfielder, Texas Tech. Oh, so that is the Texas Tech one. Yeah, he he had his bat. Um, he Did his brother his bat, go to Tech too, though? I don't know, but his bat starts like in his stance, like um, Chuck Knobloch's used to, where it's oh, t- really? it's, it's tipped back. But didn't it say it was his first home run or something? It was his first homer in the minors. Yeah, what so do you did think he of just get drafted, or was he drafted he just, three years just, ago? No, he just got no, no. That's his older brother. Okay, so the I don't know brother the Jace. One, no. I don't. Okay, the older brother I liked. Okay. Um, I, I I don't I haven't seen him, so no, I don't okay. know. I uh, I like. It. I'm just throwing this out. There. You like it? I'll have to I check it out then. Swing. Yeah, uh, he's got like Raul Abanez in him, but shorter, shorter bat path. Hmm. Very exciting. I th- I think he's gonna. Mm. I don't want to get. I don't want to get too much into it, but okay. Well, we'll have to review it at some point. So he just signed this year, this draft. Yes, Texas okay. Tech out of Texas Tech, and he had again. He he. I, he might have fixed it a little bit, but I mean, when he was in college, his bat, and again, this is more visual, but his bat, his barrel of his bat was so tipped back towards the, the catcher yeah. and the knob was fa- actually almost facing the pitcher. Yeah. And now it's a little more squared up. Yeah. So I'm sure but he's got a beautiful swing. Yeah. He probably loads it up when he, uh, is he a left handed hitter? Yeah. Okay. So his brother was right handed, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Wasn't he a shortstop? His or... brother was drafted by the, the Rangers. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I'll check Jones. it out. Yeah, he's send a, me the clip. We'll do. Okay. Uh, next week, preventing the lunge. That's our topic at hand. Another mechanical topic, preventing the lunge. A lot of kids have problems with this and it starts with the lower body. So we'll talk about that. Preventing the lunge next week. We did the lab promo, right? Epstein Online Hitting Academy. We're good there. Uh, Cross functionality with Cassie and I, Cassie Riley Bosha. Um, part three of her national championship season this week. Yes, part three of the national championship season, talking about the SEC tournament, the Super Regionals, and a little bit of the World Series as well. So um, that's a lot of fun. Please subscribe to that Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, and Softball Strength Academy YouTube page to watch that show. Anything else, sir? No, sir. No. Well, good luck in New York, and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.